going to sing a hymn to our Lord. 359. 359. up the Gospel of Mark today and we ended on number uh, 25 and 26 27 in there uh, John Mark Father bless the lesson uh, edify the believer bear witness to the truth and strengthen the saint as we increase uh, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen Amen this is uh, meant for knowledge John was Mark's Hebrew name Mark was his Latin name he is called by both names Let's uh, look these up. Acts 12, 12. Acts 12, 12. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, <coughs> where, where many were gathered together praying. Excuse me. In verse 25. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. There, Acts 15, 37. So uh, here at Acts 13, you've got Barnabas and Paul, go, Saul, go out on a journey to plant churches and spread the, the uh, gospel message. Verse 37 of 15, Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. So that's where it was uh, given um, the three times where both names show up together. By the way, when they returned, 
uh, when they returned, uh, what was the big controversy in Acts 15? Anybody recall what that is? What's the big controversy? Keeping of the law. Say that again. Keeping of the law. Uh, yeah, uh, the keeping of the law, meaning and, and, and mainly who was coming into the church. It would have been the keeping. It would have been. It would have entailed that. Uh, who who was being getting saved? Gentiles, Gentiles, and obviously they didn't have to keep the law. And so now you got you you you've got this problem. You got the Gentiles and the Jews, and the Jews didn't want the Gentiles in. And so there, it, it's uh, changing. And by the way, things do change. Uh, over the years, things change. I, I was going to uh, give an example of that. I had recently read uh, something that rose at Xerox for me, Charlie Chaplin's music. Maybe I'll bring that up. Uh, and, and when Charlie Chaplin discovered music and, and how things have changed. Anyway, uh, to smooth it all over so that there wasn't going to be a church split and fighting and arguing, is when you bring it up, let, let's say I bring up something within the congregation, there's not a lot of people here to have a fight. But when you bring it up, sometimes that could cause a rumble. And so what Paul and Barnabas did was they called the elders in first. A small group got all of them on the same page first. In other words, there's, there is wisdom to this, this type of thing. Is you, you, he, they got all of them on first, then they kind of called for more of a general assembly, then brought it up where it was a problem and people were arguing, fighting, but then they, 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 they had those that were supporting them that would, we would consider them pillars in the church to support what they were saying to convince the other people. But if they had gone in cold turkey, who knows what that, it, you, you have to exercise wisdom when you're negotiating and dealing with people, dealing with people. So the change was coming that the Gentiles were going to be saved and come into the church. And that is one of uh, the mysteries is that the church is part of the body of Christ. That's a, a mystery. One of the uh, mysteries, uh, you can look that up. We are to be stewards of the mysteries. Just look up the word mystery and you can find all the mysteries that are in the Bible, in the New Testament. Curse three times. He is called John twice in Acts 13, verse 15 and 13. 15, uh, he is... Uh, Acts 13, what did I say? Acts 13, I'm sorry, 13 verse 5. Preaching, also John to their minister. They had John there, was there, and also in verse 13. John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. Um, he is called Mark five times. Acts 15 verse 39. We'll just randomly look these up. Uh, and so Barnabas took Mark uh, with him. It's, uh, he occurs in Colossians 4.10. Colossians 4.10. Get there. He is called uh, uh, Mark. Uh, uh, yeah. Let's see, uh, he is called 410. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salute you, and Marcus, it's called Marcus, their sister, son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive command. If he come unto you, receive him. Uh, in Philemon uh, 24, that'd be just before Hebrews here. He, uh, Philemon 24, Marcus, Aristocrats, Demas, Lucas, he's, he's listed with a, 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 a group of people. 
By the way, all the people that are in Philemon all represent then the story. Uh, you know, if I don't have it written down in this Bible, uh, there's Paul, uh, Onesimus, is the, I, isn't he the runaway slave? Uh, we have, uh, and he is to be restored to uh, I'm trying to see the other name in here. Pardon? Verse 2. Yeah, there's Aphia and Archippus. And I'm just surprised I don't have it written down in my side column of who they represent. Paul uh, Paul says, put that on my account. Paul would represent Christ here. Uh, Onesimus would represent the lost sinner. And he's being restored. Oh, I can't see the name. Yeah, where, where uh, give me the verse. Oh, to Philemon. I, it would be to Philemon himself would would be, would represent uh, God being restored to him and and if there's anything else on the account that Onesimus has done Paul says put that on my account so Christ is taking whatever the sins are putting them on him reconciling him unto Philemon and having him return all right so uh, you're going to find this message everywhere it's everywhere in the uh, if you're looking for it. Um, 2 Timothy 4.11. 2 Timothy 4.11. <coughs> Excuse me. Going Luke is with me, take Mark. Bring him with thee. He is profitable for me in the ministry. This is where... Uh, Paul has a reconciliation and a change of heart about Mark. And we'll, I think that's coming up here. 1 Peter 5.3. We go to 1 Peter 5.3. Uh, 5.13. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluted you, and so doth Marcus, my son. He's called, again, Marcus there, which is John Mark. Um, and then there is a, a question as to who Babylon is. What is Babylon? Uh, spiritually speaking, Revelation isn't. Uh, what's Jerusalem called? I, I can't recall the verse. I'm throwing it out to you to see if it is, you do your Rolodex if it comes up. Jerusalem is called uh, spiritually. Uh, oh, it's called Sodom and Egypt. Yes, yeah, Sodom. Yeah, Sodom and Egypt. Yeah, and then uh, uh, that would uh, Babylon. Some say that it is Rome, and uh, we could disprove that where uh, Paul says he uh, went. Paul went to Rome, and he, I think Peter says he goes to Babylon, and they want to make that Rome. And what is the proof text that Peter did go to Rome? What would be the verse to prove that? Who wants to claim that Peter was there? What group of people? The Roman Catholics. You know, he's the first one, the Pope. And so to disprove that, Paul said he would go only go where no man has ever been. He wanted to be the, the pioneer. So Babylon is Babylon and Rome is Rome. But they want to com combine the two. You know, some groups want to combine the two as, as one and the same thing. But Paul says that he, uh, he, did not, uh, he, he didn't want to go where another man had already been. He didn't want to go, go there. 
All right, many believe uh, Mark 14. This is when the young, if we go to the Gospel of Mark. Well, Babylon would be Iraq, wouldn't it? Persia? It would be, what, uh, I want to say, our, uh, Iraq, uh, Damascus. Where's Damascus? Uh, Pardon? Damascus is Syria. It's Syria. That's it. Yeah, but what we're talking in that area. Well, Saddam Hussein wanted, uh, was uh, rehanging the, the, the... He wanted to rebuild that. The, the gardens of Babylon, hanging gardens. Yeah, he wanted to rebuild He started, he started, to, rebuild he started to rebuild that. That's true. Uh, Mark 14, verses 51 and 52. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And many believe that the young man there that flees naked there uh, is uh, John Mark. And now, what, what mainly what you find in uh, those that make comments on these verses and you want to look that up and who's that young man and, and, and so on and so forth is what do most commentaries then say when they, when they approach those type of things? Anybody know what they usually say? He wasn't really naked. Oh wait, oh, now yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to that. But they'll, uh, they'll say, uh, they basically say nothing. If they don't know what it means, they skip it. And there's a lot of verses that, that they skip. Pink, Arthur Pink, it's recommended reading in, in any of these schools, our school that I went to, and, and I certainly read Arthur Pink. It's really got a lot of good stuff, but anytime you find where it's salvation by grace and not by, and, and not by uh, the Presbyterian thing, the uh, the, uh, the uh, tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. They, he skips those verses, man. Well, of course, salvation by grace, for the chosen. Oh, yeah, and they change, uh, yeah, that means he died for the world. Jesus died for the world. And then they add, of saved people. <laughs> of saved people. Is that when, when they get to, in Genesis, when they get to the girl, and they asked the girl, will you go with this man? Isn't that uh, Isaac and, and, and the girl, will you go with this man? Well, she says, yes, I'll go. He skips those verses. Those verses do not appear in, in those commentaries, in Pink's commentary on Genesis. All that stuff is skipped. The moment they get to uh, a predestination uh, where it's salvation by grace and, and not pre, uh, where, where you're making the decision, they, they skip those verses, man. They, because they can't explain them. And so uh, if, if you read Spurgeon, there's all kinds of preachers that come against Spurgeon, but Spurgeon jumps ship, he, he plays both sides of the fence. He says, yes, I agree with, with I, I'm trying to think of, the, what do you call the Presbyterians, sir? They're uh, Calvinists. He's a Calvinist, versus he's a Calvinist, until he finds verses that he can't, he can't explain. Then he jumps fat, fat, the fence and he becomes a Baptist. And so then all the Calvinists get mad at him, and then, then he goes back, to, he, he jumps back and forth. Because there's verses you cannot explain. You just can't explain. Anyway, uh, getting back to this naked thing, we learned in, uh, uh, for some guys, it was their favorite class. For my, for myself personally, it was one of the worst classes I had, where they taught um, uh, Bible customs. Bible customs. So, what does it mean uh, to heap coals of fire on the head of a of a man, on your enemy, heaping coals of fire? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's when you do good to them. Say that again. Do good to your enemies and thereby putting coals of fire in your head. Do good to your enemies? Yeah. Well, what does it mean to have coals of fire on your head? Because you're going to be mad that you were good at them. No, they would say, well, uh, you, didn't, you didn't have matches. You didn't have Ohio blue tip. By the way, what is the blue tip? They don't have it today. 
You can get it online, you can click online for that. What you do is you take a hollow key. Anybody know what a hollow key is? You take a hollow key. It could be a cabinet key, and it could be fairly deep. And you, t and you tie on, it, it, you could do it, you could, uh, uh, you basically it's a zip gun. It, it, they make it in prison. They're working on the lathe, they drill a, a 22 caliber in the hole. They load it up with shot. And then they put a twist on the end of it. They can, it's really easily, to, it's easy to conceal. I think they call it a zip gun. And you take the Ohio blue tip. What's the blue tip? Anybody know? Because in the Western, they're, they're just striking it on their boot, on the wall. So what's the blue tip? Washers? No, I'm pretty sure it's gunpowder. That's gunpowder. So you break them off in there. Maybe you're right. You break them off, and my dad taught me this. This is, this is what you do in 1910. Then you take a nail, the same diameter, just and you put it in there, and you tie it together with a leather strap. And then you, I built it for the kids. I wanted to show them how that, as a mechanical engineer. And so you're whipping it, you whip it around, and then you slam it up against the steps. It explodes, it makes a humongous explosion. Kaboom. It's a firecracker, is what you're igniting, and it's done with compression. Now, why did I say that? Oh, is you didn't travel around with matches, so you put the fire on the head, you're carrying the fire with you. So if you put fire on your enemy's head, you're not doing them bad, you're doing them, you're doing them good. Now, that might be true, I don't know, but it's neither here nor there with me. But they would want to say, what is the nakedness? Are, is John Mark naked? They would say no. It, it would be equivalent to a, uh, a cowboy when you see him in, uh, out on the prairie and he takes all his clothes off, what is he wearing? What is he wearing? Yeah, what is that underwear? We call that what in the wintertime? Long johns. And what's that made out of? Cotton because his clothes are made out of what? What's his clothes made out of? Linen. Oh, my mother would make me wear a certain shirt. I hated it. I'd be in first grade. Oh, it was, it was wool. This is wool. But I don't know what they do to it. It's no longer itchy. Right. If you wear wool from 60 years ago, you're just, oh. So they must have wore the linen, linen garment. All right, so uh, they would say that he was not naked, he's wearing a, a linen garment or he's wearing underwear. My Bible says he's naked. It, it's not gonna change the flavor of the soup, but it's in there. By the way, what is a priest supposed to wear when they go in? What kind of clothing? Yeah, anybody know what it, what? It, right. It is called linen. Now we'll liken that unto cotton. It isn't cotton, but it's linen. Now whatever linen is made of, he is not to wear wool. He is not to wear anything that would make him sweat. So what is that teaching? Salvation by grace. There's no work to this. So when the priest is doing his office, he is to wear linen, so he is there's no sweat. You see how this is all throughout the Bible. You know, grace all the way through. It's all, all the way through there. Anyway, where are we at here? So uh, the one in Mark 14, it's believed that that is John Mark, the, the young man that uh, uh, runs away naked. Acts 12:12. 12, 12. Go back there. We've already been there. It is Mark's mother. This is where Peter comes. He goes through the gates. <coughs> when he goes through the iron gate, it opens up its own accord. All those are types of going into heaven, leaving hell, getting out of hell. Hell has bars. Where does hell have bars? What book says that hell, hell has bars? Anybody know? It's where Jonah goes down in there. There's bars there. there. So there's, there's bars there. 
And so uh, when he, and he says, and Jesus said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Meaning he's coming out of the grave alive, and that means you and I are coming out of the grave alive. The gates of hell will not prevent, prevent this. The church is coming out, Jesus is coming out, and we're following him. The church is coming out also. Uh, we'll have that in the sermon today. Uh, 12, 12. And when he had uh, considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, there were, where many were gathered together praying. So many are gathered there. So the, uh, the, the idea here is it was a rendezvous for members of the church. It probably it means that she probably had a little bit of money. Uh, what's the other one that had a seller of purple cloth? Lydia. Lydia, if you're a, a woman's liver in the church, they'll, they'll, point, they'll point to Deborah. They'll, they'll point to all these women. They'll, they, they hang on Lydia. They go for Lydia. Well, see, Lydia, she was a successful businesswoman. And uh, they don't consider, how did the business get started? It, it, it just, she was a seller of purple cloth. She was able to entertain Paul and, uh, and Silas and all. Where I say, well, Lydia, who dies first, the husband or the wife? Generally. Husband dies first. Who started the who started the uh, sell, selling of purple cloth then? And my assumptions are just as wacky as their assumptions that they go to. They make assumptions, so I'll make my own assumptions. So who started the selling of the purple cloth? Who, who was the the trader and the uh, one that or the husband did? Her his wife was probably involved in and in learned the ropes. And she, she helped it along with him. And so when he died, he took, she took over the business. It didn't mean she was some kind of an entrepreneur. It, and my story just makes as much sense as their story. You can take your pick. So anytime that always comes up, I like to bring that up. I said, she just took over the family business. His father. Pardon? His father. Her wife's father. Her husband's father. She did what? I, he, she took over his spot. That's what happens in a lot of these businesses. His, his it goes father. on. Anyway. Her father-in-law. Her father-in-law started the business. It, it could have been that. Okay, Mark was the nephew of Barnabas. <laughs> Colossians 4.10. He was the nephew. Uh, 410, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salute you and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, uh, touching whom he received commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. By the way, who, uh, who, vouched, for, uh, who vouched for Paul when he was arrested? Pardon? He vouched for Paul. He whispered something to the, uh, to the uh, centurion. He said, I got, I got some message to tell you. It was the, it was the, it could have been this relation. It was a cousin or a nephew vouch for him. You see, in other words, Christianity, it's a family affair. There's nothing wrong with a person getting saved and then they end up saving, uh, leading their wife or the wife leads the husband, their children. And then, and then it spreads that way it, and, and becomes a family affair. Obviously, Jesus and John the Baptist, they're, they're related. It's a family affair. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the, the, he's the nephew of Barnabas. All right, Mark it was the first short-term missionary. He got cold feet, folks. And he hightailed it home. And... Uh, and by the way, if you're going to be a preacher, who do you want to have call you? God. You want to be God called, not... What's the next word? God called, not mama called. Right? 
If you're God called, you're, you're going to stick it out loyal to, to the end. And sometimes the role that you play may not be a lifelong role. Some of those that came and preached for the rebuilding of the temple, uh, one preached for three months, another one preached for years, three years. Uh, what was, uh, who, who took down the, uh, uh, the body of Christ? Joe. Pardon? Joe. Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph did. And, and Nicodemus. And Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus is a lifer. Joseph of Arimathea is not. That is the only record of him doing, you may be, as a Christian, called only to do one thing. And you fulfilled your role. To say that you've got to be full time and you know, God will use you where he knows that he's going to use you. And that was, the, when we say the only test, what a test that was. But that was the only event that is recorded for that. By the way, uh, uh, was Jonah, was that, his first, uh, was that his first calling? No, he's called before that. That was an, uh, Jonah in the book of Jonah, in the whale. That was another assignment. He shows up in Kings somewhere. He had another assignment. All right, for short term, 1225, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John Mark. All right, they take with them John Mark uh, thir by 135. And when they were at Salem, as they preached the word in the synagogues, they also took John Mark to their minister, verse 13. And when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Philia, and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't say why, but he went. But Paul was not happy about it. All right? The second time they venture out, there was a fallout between Bar Paul and Barnabas. Uh, let's see. That first event, that is 45 A.D., by uh, Acts 15, you go there, uh, 45 A.D., this is uh, 51 A.D., so we're, we're talking, there's a few years in here, 36 through 39, and some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let's uh, go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. All right, so he, he kind of skipped out and there was a, and they had a fall and then the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus and Paul chose Silas. And so they parted company. And, uh, and Paul writes about that, about women fighting in the church. I think it's in, um, uh, if it's not Ephesians, it's Philippians, where he, he asks that two women would reconcile and stop fighting in the church. Uh, there are fights that go on in the church, and which should never really happen. We want to avoid that. Uh, Mark then proves himself 11 years later in Philemon 24, and we've already, I, I believe we've read those verses. In fact, we're way over here. Let, we'll, I was gonna hopeful to finish that today, but let us, uh, we'll, we'll begin here. So sometimes people can be useful, and then other times they kind of forsake the Lord, and then, uh, and they can be restored again. So never, never count people out. Uh, 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 we, we want to win, you, you want to win people over. It, it's kind of like winning over a Roman Catholic. You agree with them up to a point wherever you can build bridges, but when that stops, it, you know, you, you have to stand your ground. But we are to, as Paul writes, therefore knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We do our best to persuade. Persuade. It's persuasion. Father, bless now the preaching in Christ's name.